So, one of our lovely viewers sent us this paragraph essentially. It's a it's a it's a paragraph from Blaker's um affidavit. Exhibit A statement of Blaker. <laughs> What's his name? Dustin Blaker? I think it's Dustin Blaker. Um yeah. I'm not I'm not scrolling all the way to the top. I don't care that much. You know who I'm talking it's about. Dusty Boo. Um but J Ray sent us this part and said she felt like it was really important. Uh I don't know why she felt like it was really important. Do you remember what she said about why it's important? I mean, I don't think I have it in front of I don't, I don't think, think she, she gave said. any details. She just said it was really strange. And then I read it and I was like, hmm. Interesting. That is weird. Yeah. So I'm going to read it to you and then we're going to talk about it. So this is from page, it starts on page 19 and finishes on page 20. And it's the bottom paragraph of page 19. And this is the attached Blaker affidavit to the Washington search warrant. Um, it says the King Road residence contained a significant amount of blood from the victims. And again, we're talking about Idaho 4. Okay. Idaho 4 case, Brian Cobert. And start over. The King Road residence contained a significant amount of blood from the victims, including splatter and cast off. I should have probably gave a trigger warning. We're talking about blood. So if that's something you can't handle next time, join us, skip ahead. Um, and then in, in uh, quotations, not quotations. I can't think right now. Parentheses. It says blood stain pattern resulting from blood drops released from an object due to its motion. Which is interesting. Which, based on my training, makes it likely that this evidence was transferred to Koberger's person, clothing, or shoes. Based on the locations of the suspect vehicle and the 8458 phone immediately following the murders, it is probable that Koberger went home to his residence at 1630 or 1630 Northeast Valley Road, G201. At that time, it is likely that he still had blood or other trace evidence on his person, clothes, or shoes, including skin cells or hair from the victims, or from Gonzalez's dog. It is likely that some trace evidence was transferred to areas in his apartment through contact with items worn during the attack. One likely location for the clothes, mask, shoes that he was wearing during the attack would be his residence. While I believe Koberger is visiting family in Pennsylvania over the current school break at WSU, I believe he intends to return for the start of the next semester, so I expect his belongings to still be in his residence at 1630 Northeast Valley Road, G201. Okay, first thing. It said there was splatter and cast off, and this bloodstain pattern is blood drops released from an object due to its motion, right? Mm-hmm. So what does that mean exactly? Well, when we're looking at cast off, uh, it's when an object is swung in an arc and flings blood onto nearby surfaces. This occurs when an assailant swings the bloodstained object be back before inflicting another blow. Analysts can tell the direction of the impacting object by the shape of the splatter. Tails point in the direction of the motion. Counting the arcs can also show the minimum number of blows delivered. Yes, it can. Blood splatter can tell a lot. It, All you Dexter fans would know this. Yes. So it can tell a lot. They can also determine even like the speed and force Absolutely. like they can tell a they lot can tell the height of the suspect they can tell the uh what what uh position the suspect and victim's body was at the time of that swing um what else they can tell a lot like a lot they can so they can measure the width and length of the stain the angle of impact can be calculated they can they can calculate a ton from it, um, which is interesting. 
I'm super curious where they were seeing cast off and why they believe it'd be on his. Per- I mean, I think all of us know there is absolutely no way whoever did this didn't get blood on them. I think it's yeah. an impossibility. It it's is. not even possible. And the fact that they're highlighting his shoes and there's no apparent blood trail. They only mention a single latent shoe print. Well, and remember when we talked about the Pennsylvania warrants uh, a few days ago, they specifically said that they were searching his car for his gas pedal and his brake pedal because there's some, there must have been some kind of reason they believed there was blood. On his shoes. On his shoes, which would have then transferred over to the pedals, yes. And they, they also <clears throat> had to have mentioned that latent shoe print for a reason in the PCA. Yeah. What does that mean? Like, how can they believe he was in and out of there that fast, but also there was a latent shoe print that wasn't visible to the naked eye? It literally indicating it had to have been cleaned up or are they suggesting it had worn off enough that i mean then why wouldn't they mention a trail of footsteps and remember the diamond pattern they're looking for a diamond pattern and they didn't find it for a reason yeah and they didn't find it no they didn't find it in brian koberger's residence no Mm -mm. really 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 interesting so I mean, and Brian Koberger didn't wear van style diamond pattern shoes uh, from any pictures or background that we can see. But, uh, you know, would a criminal be smart enough to use different shoes? I mean, that's what I would have done. And I'm not trying to suggest his guilt here. I'm just trying to give uh, real life plausible situations, right? Yep. Yeah, they can. There's so much they can tell from the blood splatter. And then I started thinking, okay, so we know that they could probably determine, like, okay, this person had to have blood on them. They had to have been standing here. The victim had to be here at all these points of impact. If they fought, they could tell all of that, that there was a struggle other than just the identifying marks on the, the defense wounds on the bodies, but also like, the blood splatter could help determine that too. Um, where the people were when they were initially attacked. That's a big deal. But, okay, so moving on from that. So, we're being sold the narrative he was in and out of there in like nine minutes, right? This this timeline got more and more compressed, It went from about an hour to down to like literally nine minutes. And I know a lot of people are saying that's not impossible. Like that is possible. And I agree with you. It is possible. The issue I have is that it is impossible for him to not have blood on him. And he got in the car and sped off. Are you telling me he had enough time to kill all those people, run out to his car and disrobe? And leave no trail in the home. No trail leading outside and nothing in the car. And then people say, well, he had enough time to clean up. But they detected no harsh chemicals in the car. So I started started thinking, well, what kind of solvents are typically used? What are the most, what gets rid of blood the best? Like, what is the best chemicals for getting rid of blood? What? I, I don't I don't want to throw you off. Get get to a point where I can interrupt you. No, go ahead. We can cover the chemicals in a second. Um we just covered the phone records, okay? I can't believe I read this earlier and I didn't like connect the dots. That's very unlike me. Um, but it says in here, based on the location of the suspect's vehicle and eight four five eight phone immediately. Following the murders. What do you mean? His 8458 phone was nowhere near the house immediately following the murders, at least from 3 to 5 a.m. Whoa. Yeah. Because I would not consider anything after 5 immediate. Yeah. 
And they don't even mention him taking that loop. Blaker literally says he would have went home and likely had the blood still on him. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I was going to bring that up, too. I just wanted to cover the chemicals first. but I didn't realize it until right now. But, you know, I, I read this in passing earlier because I was in the middle of research and stuff for the DNA. Um, but that's very interesting. Like... I agree. That... What? Wait. So why does Blaker think he knows where the 8458 phone is immediately following the murders. When I hear immediately following the murders, that is in tandem with the car at the crime scene location. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. But the 8458 phone wasn't connected to any towers associated with Moscow between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. <laughs> And if he made this big old loop and didn't return home for like a, a long time, then why would you say immediately? And he would like anybody who sees that route that they're alleging he took assumes he took that route to get rid of evidence. Like, yeah. duh. So why would you assume he had anything on him? Instead, he acts like it was immediate and he would for sure have something on him, which this is a search warrant. OK, this is the exhibit affidavit attached to a Washington search warrant to get access to his apartment. That's, so, but that clearly, just proves clearly That's this evidence, clearly this statement of his is specific to his apartment to try to get access to it. I, I hear you, and I think you're right. I agree. I think you're right. But does that justify lying. law enforcement lying? Who's lying? Is it Blaker or is it uh, Payne. Payne? Who's lying here? One of them's lying. Because one is saying that they know where the 8458 phone is between 3 and 5 a.m. That's That's literally what he's saying right here. And that he returned home immediately following well, the murders. It's, it is probable that Koberger went to his residence. So, um, I mean, that probable is important. But he's not saying it's probable we know where the 8458 phone is. He's saying based on factual, based on the locations of the suspect's vehicle and 8458 phone immediately following the murders. Dude. Immediately is one right after another. When I hear immediate, that's minutes, seconds, right after the murder. Yeah, or else you wouldn't put immediately. You just say following the murders. Right. So one of them is lying. That's not a maybe lie. This is a 100% black and white, right? With the sheath, you have Blaker and you have Payne. Okay, fine. Blaker maybe walked around the house and didn't see the sheath. That's strange. I doubt it. But okay, possible. You could sell me that story. These are two like blatantly obvious statements that contradict each other. Yeah, it's concerning. So what, some of the evidence is not true. <clears throat> some of the evidence is fabricated. It's either Blaker or Paynes. So if we're, because Ann Taylor said in court, there is no DNA in his apartment. There is no DNA evidence in the car. Y'all found nothing. You didn't find anything. I was, and then people make the argument, well, he probably cleaned it. You know, he's, he's, um, he's a criminology student, meaning he has to know how to clean up blood, which I don't think is entirely true. He was being trained in, uh, technology, like forensics, like digital forensics. Mm -hmm. He was not being trained like, a, what are they called? A forensic technician that collects yeah. evidence clean or client crime scene cleanup. Um, yeah, I don't. Sense. I don't think he was being trained in like general forensics. He was literally focusing on technology mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, there might be some kind of minor in that. I don't really yep. know. But... There could have been. There could have been. Um, I'm curious what his coursework was and if he ever took a class about crime scene cleanup or, you know, identifying residue of cleaning agents used in a crime scene. And I would like to look more into this. This is um, a study on basically cleaners and solvents used for cleaning up blood and how effective they are. But I haven't found anything showing, is there a solvent or chemical that cleans blood and leaves no residue? It disintegrates and nobody can test for it. I'm not sure about that yet, but I'll put a picture up here. Um, and it tests it on plastic, metal, and wood. And we're looking at the yield here. Um, the ones with the lowest percentages did the best. So it is fresh bleach, stored bleach, trigene, and sodium hypochlorite did the best and got rid of every trace of DNA. Like the DNA could not be collected from those services. Sure. sure. That's Which interesting. is, yeah. So the cleaning procedures of ethanol and UV were quite inefficient but, when used alone. Uh, just to be clear, though, uh, bleach has negative effects, though, that come with it. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, you couldn't use it in your car. Like altering the colors. I think most people probably know what bleach does, right? You put bleach on any dyed surfaces or colored surface, and it's going to start uh, altering the color of those items. And it would bleach, have been obvious. Bleach leaves also leaves a residue that can be detected later. And I've still seen people use bleach, and luminol will show blood was there, but that doesn't necessarily mean they could collect DNA from it. Oh, gosh, I think we maybe would have heard that. I don't know if there was some kind of blood there, but, you know. No, I'm not saying that. No, I, I know. I know. I'm, I'm I don't believe he used loud. bleach. I'm like, thinking out loud. I believe that there was no blood in the car or the, the crime or the apartment. But I'm curious, like, if somebody is savvy enough in forensics, would they know a chemical to use that they know it dissipates and disintegrates it so fast that nobody could test for it or ever see blood was there or ever see that DNA was there. So um, this discusses the results a little bit. So ethanol and UV were inefficient when used alone with DNA recoveries of up to 11 and 73%. From all services. However, the combination of both treatments was much more efficient with recoveries between 0.1 to 0.7% from three services. Moreover, fresh bleach, stored bleach, trigene, and sodium hypochlorite were very efficient in removing DNA with recoveries of 0.0 to 0.3% from all services. Um, these five decontamination strategies um, resulted in less than 1% of the DNA recovered from the surface. Um, in addition, if accepting up to 5% recovered DNA, uh, Vercon is also efficient. 5%, that's quite a bit, so that's not even important to me. Uh, for cell-contained DNA in the form of blood, the recoveries expressed in mtDNA copies MT DNA copies and the percent of recovery relative to the no treatment controls are shown in table two blood. Uh, as for blood, the cleaning procedures of UV and L ethanol were relatively ineffective when used alone, but they were better in combination, um, but still not great. So we're, I'm looking for bleach. Where's bleach? Uh, if it, Oh, so I believe this was touch DNA. Yes, I believe that was touch DNA. I was literally reading the wrong one. <laughs> I was looking for blood. <laughs> um, so is this the right one? Okay, so this is the different services. This is blood. Uh, so where is bleach and trigene? 
Why are they not mentioning that now? Okay, we're just going to look at the chart because that seems more simple. Uh, the efficiency of cell-contained DNA blood removal after cleaning with different treatments on plastic, metal, and wood surfaces. The table is summarizing the mean in, I'm assuming MT means mitochondrial DNA. Okay. I'm assuming because I don't see that defined right here. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, and standard devi deviation per category, yeah. three to five biological replicates. The efficiency yield is expressed as the percentage of recovered MT DNA copies of the no treatment controls. So yield here. Let's see which ones are best. You know, you know what's interesting about this hmm. is that on neither plastic, metal, or wood were any of these, like, okay, so plastic, metal, none of them were 0% like they were for the touch DNA, which I think is up here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I don't think touch DNA has the possibility of it absorbing into, uh, any surfaces, right? Because of its, uh, how heavy it is, it's more than likely going to sit atop of it, even from, uh, friction, you know, mm -hmm. just from, uh, the friction that waves, uh, static, uh, you know, mm, it'll okay. sit on top of items. But yeah, it is mitochondria. Okay. It is? Mm -hmm. They use the abbreviation MT? Yep. It's mitochondrial. Okay, so this is comparing also cell-free and cell-contained DNA. Can you look up what the difference between that is? Where is it? Cell-free DNA and cell-contained DNA. Yeah, uh, I just covered this. Yeah, but I don't remember. I'm trying to remember right now because I know you did talk about it. Um, so with blood, the only cleaners that removed it completely and for oddly enough, the only ones that are 0% are on wood and it's Vercon and D a DNA remover, which are brand names. And then from metal, the lowest percentage, uh, was Vercon, which was 0 0.0 or 0.1%. 0 uh, but, you know, like stored bleach did pretty good at 0.4%. Fresh bleach, 0.7%. Plastic was, um, trigene was at 0.8%, which is, oh, no. So UV and ethanol was 0.6%, which was the best one. And then trigene is after that at 0.8. So, like, Is there any cleaner you could use that doesn't cause a negative effect and doesn't leave? I think the only one that sounds like it wouldn't leave any kind of residue is like ethanol and UV light combined. Yeah. Because ethanol would dissipate and I don't think you could test for it eventually, like after a few weeks or And there's no days. adverse effects on materials with ethanol? Well, it says... Ethanol mixed with UV light is more effective. Now, it wasn't the best one out of any of these. And we're we're looking at the chart that is specifically about blood right now. Blood yeah. seems way harder to get rid of than the other chart showed, which the other chart was uh, cell-free DNA. Well, yeah, cell-free DNA is just like your uh, your trace DNA. Your, That's your, what I thought it meant. Your fingerprint DNA, yeah. That's what I thought it meant, but I could be wrong. So correct me if we're wrong, guys. Um, I did, I did, I did see something about what it was. I just can't remember. But um, no, you're right. That's what it, it is. It is trace DNA. Yeah, cell free. It, it, cell free DNA is any DNA that doesn't come from the center of a cell. So yes, trace okay. DNA. I mean, it could even be like embryonic. Uh, I think uh, it, it would be, uh, I think hair without the. Uh, oh, without the root. Yep. Okay. Hair without the root. Things okay. like that. Okay. So I'm just, I'm, none of these percentages are impressive with the blood. I mean, except for like, like I said, the brand names Vercon and DNA remover at 0.0%. Um, so my 
It would be interesting. And they don't even have the lowest percentage altogether, like for all three services, which is also weird to me. Like DNA remover was one of the worst on metal and plastic, but was the best on wood. Vercon, I think, is overall the best because plastic, it was 0.8% on plastic, 0.1% on metal, and zero on wood. Yeah. I mean, so I would be interested to look up that brand name and see if there's anything surrounding it that shows that it doesn't leave any kind of testable residue. Like what chemicals are in it? Yeah, we can look that up between now and the true crime talk show that we're going to be, uh, you know, kind of digging into this and, and looking at it from that perspective. Um, but uh, still to think that you would have a doctorate level criminology student that would be able to outsmart the FBI. I, I, that, that just doesn't feel very possible, right? I'm sure the, that this is not a new technique. It, not, I think I'm 100% positive. This is a new technique that people are trying to get rid of DNA uh, or cellular evidence. Um, and the FBI would be able to tell right in these situations. I'm sure they have countermeasure testing to be able to see if there was any uh, re regions that were used to remove DNA or cellular uh, bio whatever, you know, from a human. So, you know, what's interesting is that Skin, you, muscle, you, you, hair. UV light worked better on DNA that was in blood than cell free DNA, trace DNA. It worked better on the blood DNA. So I wonder if you cleaned your car out really good with like the Vercon is literally the best cleaner for blood DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, if you did that and cleaned your whole car with it, and then you did a series of UV light treatments. Okay. If that would work like to where there's literally nothing, but think about know. that your whole car in your whole apartment. Yeah. I don't know. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. It seems like too much work. It seems like it's better to prevent the DNA ever getting into those areas. So I just don't think he, if, if he accomplishes and he's the guy, he didn't accomplish it by cleaning the car or the apartment. Yeah. He did it some other way. But I'm curious to know what you guys think about it. Um, the, the idea of the cleaner is really interesting to me um, because I think at some point, wouldn't you have to use some type of cleaner? Yeah. Like you would literally have to, even yeah. if you're not scrubbing like it's your whole car. literally not possible. It's just not possible. Well, I heard somebody recently claim there are cases of people who didn't transfer blood to their car or house. And I want to know that to everybody out there, if you know of a case where somebody committed a br as brutal of a crime as this and didn't no, transfer mean, any, any, crime. Any, yeah. any DNA or blood outside of the crime scene to their personal you know, property or wherever they went after, let me know, because I've, I've heard that claim with nothing backing it, and I'm curious if it ever has happened. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because it I'm, seems I'm impossible. I'm curious of it, too. I, I also some kind, saw some kind of ridiculous posting that said uh, there was some kind of police uh, report made on the night of the crime that they saw a car that had plastic sheeting halfway up their window. <laughs> what? It's so ridiculous. People so, are not going to be driving down the road and they're like, oh my gosh, did you see that car? It had plastic halfway up its window. I better call 911 now. Not happening. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll show this study in the true crime talk show and I'm going to try to find another study about like the chemicals within some of these and, um, you know, see if they leave residue and we'll talk more about it then. Um, because I really just, I just wanted to look at that chart for the blood DNA. That was it because uh, of this particular topic. So I didn't dig too much into the whole study, but 
I'll read it and we'll go over it on the True Crime Talk Show. But let me know what you guys think. If you have anything to add to this, if you know any case where no blood was ever transferred anywhere outside of the crime scene at all, or if you know about cleaners that could accomplish what literally the state is alleging was accomplished here. Um, let me know.